you hate it when you're misunderstood? And you get annoyed when you found out you, you, you've misunderstood someone else? You know, I think maybe musicians are misunderstood often. Have you ever been singing a popular song only to discover that you're belting out the wrong lyrics? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've done it in worship before, you know. Don't you hate it when the song gets the words wrong? That's what Greg says. By the way, if it snows tomorrow, you all heard it. It's Greg's fault. <laughs> Well, misunderstanding lyrics is a common mistake that can take on a life of its own. Taylor Swift, or T-Swift as she's known, her single Blank Space is a good example of that. Some Swifties think that one of the lines in the song says, All the lonely Starbucks lovers. Now, we could be Starbucks lovers. <laughs> But what the song actually said is, got a long list of ex-lovers. Funny thing is, Taylor Swift's own mom thought the lyrics were all the lonely Starbucks lovers. <laughs> but there's a lot of other songs that have lines that are commonly sung wrong. Not just out of tune the way I sing them, but wrong. To Elvis's suspicious minds, people sing, we're caught in a trout, instead of we're caught in a trap. The line, I just died in your arms tonight, it must have been something you said. You know that song, right? It's often sung as, I just died in your barn tonight, mustard, no mayonnaise instead. That doesn't even make sense. Message, message in a bottle by the police has a line that says, a year has passed since I wrote my note. But people often sing, a year has passed since I broke my nose. The Bee Gees lyric, more than a woman, more than a woman to me, is often misunderstood as bald-headed woman, bald-headed woman to me. Now, there's nothing wrong with being bald as a man or a woman, but still. The line, Papa Don't Preach, from Madonna's song by the same name, is often sung. This is one of the most popular ones, common ones, is Papa Don't Peach, which, again, doesn't mean anything. The Monkey song, I'm a Believer has a line that says, then I, then I saw her face, now I'm a, a believer. It's often misunderstood as, then I saw her face, now I'm going to leave her. <laughs> it's supposed to be a love song. <laughs> and Selena Gomez's line, I'm 14 carat, in her song, Good For You, is often sung, I'm farting carrots. <laughs> 14 carat. <laughs> yeah, sometimes misunderstandings can be humorous. Sometimes not so much. Like the couple who argued for days when the wife came home from a weekend away with her friends to a freshly painted living room. Compliments of her husband. She was furious. He thought it was because she didn't like the color he chose. She actually loved the color he chose and genuinely appreciated his effort and gift and was finally able to verbalize that. She was upset about the fact that he made the decision to paint the living room without her. She was upset about being left out of the process. He was upset because his surprise in his mind was being rejected. It was an object lesson in misunderstanding. And I finally had to say, you guys are arguing about two different things. Fortunately, with a little help, they were able to work through it together. There are, but there, there are few things more annoying and frustrating than being misunderstood. Turn with me to Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. 
No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds that strong man. And then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were highly educated Jewish legal and theological experts. And they came down from Jerusalem to Capernaum to evaluate the impact of Jesus' ministry on the village of Capernaum. They've already decided that Jesus is to be rejected, but now they're trying to figure out what impact he's having on the people. Actually, from our perspective, as we think about things, because we usually take a map perspective on the world, right? We look down on it from the top, and so Capernaum's actually up from Jerusalem because it's north of Jerusalem. But they did not take that top-down look at the world. They looked at the world as we look at it like this, and Jerusalem was up in the mountains, and Capernaum was down on the Sea of Galilee. And so from that perspective, these people, these men came down to Capernaum from Jerusalem. Now, they, as I said, they've already decided Jesus is a problem. Jesus and his disciples haven't been abiding by their rules, and they've, they've gone from curious to annoyed to furious. And they've gone from indirectly attacking Jesus, you know, asking questions, trying to get him to do something wrong in front of everybody. They know in in their minds he's doing things wrong and he's saying things wrong, but they're trying to get him to kind of do that publicly. They're trying to trip him up. They've gone from that to leveling direct accusations against him. They can't deny his power. I mean, they've seen him heal. Even on the Sabbath, which they were not happy about. They've seen him drive out demons. And they can't deny his wisdom. They've been silenced by his replies to their comments and their questions. They, they no longer question his power and his wisdom. Now they question the source of it. And they offer two accusations. One, that Jesus is demon-possessed. And two, that Jesus casts out demons by colluding with a prince of demons. He's possessed himself and he's working with the prince of demons to accomplish his great miracles. They absolutely refuse to admit that his power and his wisdom come from God. But they also can't deny that he has power and wisdom. So they're left with only one option. And that's that the work of Jesus is the work of the devil himself. And that's what they start to say. The religious leaders were more interested in holding on to tradition than the work that God was doing right in front of them. Yes, God had absolutely spoken to them through Moses in the Old Testament law. But through the centuries, usually with very good intentions, they had made additions along the way. Not new laws per se, but ways to make sure that people didn't even come close to breaking the law. And ways to judge whether someone was keeping the law or not. When rules replace a relationship with God, legalism is always the result. Instead of teaching people to focus more on their own relationship with God and their own faithfulness to God's law than than on others, they created a system in which everyone was evaluating everyone else's degree of faithfulness. And that's a dangerous place to be. And these traditions had led the religious leaders to having a lot of power and influence in their world because they were the educated ones who could read and and, and could write and who had the authority in the eyes of the people to define what faithfulness looked like. So when God said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, they then created this box and this long list of rules, right? 
on how to do that. And then everybody was pointing fingers and judging everybody else and, and measuring how far you walked and how much weight you lifted and, what, and, and telling you what you could and couldn't do. And everybody was then looking around at everybody else instead of paying attention to their own faithfulness and their own walk with Christ. And Jesus is calling all of that into question. They had the Word of God. They had the law of God right in front of them and they misunderstood. And over the centuries, their misunderstanding became deeper and more significant so that by the time Jesus shows up, their rules and their traditions have become entrenched almost like a law unto itself. And the people were chafing under the burden of all the religious do's and don'ts and judging one another constantly. But the religious leaders had their authority, so they had power and they had influence and they had authority. And it's interesting that Jesus didn't ever directly question their authority. He made them look stupid. He pointed out the flaws in their logic, but he never directly questioned their authority. He didn't say, you don't have the authority. When people compared the teaching of Jesus, though, with the teaching of the scribes, they were constantly left in wonder. Almost from the beginning, Mark tells us, Mark 1.22, they were astonished at his teaching because <clears throat> he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So the scribes had authority until the people encountered one who had real authority from heaven. And the scribes are now upset about this, that their influence is waning and people are actually considering the fact that, that maybe what the way that they've been taught to live is not the right way and, and that, that maybe our religious leaders have it wrong and they're losing their grasp on people. Because in Jesus, they, they saw real authority and they experienced real authority. And by comparison, the teachings of the scribes came up wanting. It came up wanting because the teaching and, and the actions of Jesus were bringing in, ushering in the kingdom of God, while the teaching and actions of the scribes were trying to maintain tradition in the, in the status quo. <laughs> so they misunderstand Jesus. And that led them to demonize him. Look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Beelzebul was one of the gods of the Philistines in the Old Testament. So not only are they accusing Jesus of being connected with demonic powers, they're accusing him of being connected with one of the false gods, the demonic powers of one of Israel's biggest enemies before Babylon came along. It's like a double slam. Not only is he in cohorts with this demon, but it's that Philistine demon. They're accusing Jesus of being connected to the worst of the worst of the powers of darkness. They demonize Him. Because that's what we do when we don't understand. The history of the church, the people of God in the world, is filled with this group accusing that group of unfaithfulness and blasphemy. First, it was the split between Rome and Constantinople what is now the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Eastern Orthodox threw a, declared, declared that the Catholics were heretics and threw them out of the church, and the Catholics declared that the Orthodox were heretics and threw them out of the church. And then the Protestant Reformation came along, and it led to some good, healthy change. But it also represents another split in the church, and now we as Protestants think we have the corner on grace in spite of the fact that we have, since the time Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the Castle Church in Wittenberg, we, the Protestant Church, have splintered in a million different directions. And we continue to do so.
We may not demonize Jesus, but we sure do demonize one another because that's what we do when we misunderstand. A recent article in Men's Health spotlighted an unlikely friendship. It was a friendship between Colin Allred and Van Taylor. And they have a lot in common. They were, at the time of the writing of the article, both freshman lawmakers in the U.S. House of Representatives. They're both from Texas. They're both used to being part of a team. Allred spent four seasons in the NFL with the Tennessee Titans. Taylor was in the Marines for nine years. But there's one major difference. Allred is a Democrat and Taylor is a Republican. At a time when our government is intensely polarized, you'd have every reason to believe that these two aren't friends and don't get along, but they are and they do. Men's Health asked them how they managed to remain friend and here's some, friends, and here's some of their advice. Allred says, you could spend all your time focused on where you disagree with someone. Do we baptize by sprinkling or immersion? Do we baptize children and infants or only mature adults? Do we wear jeans in church or only suits and ties? Do we sing with guitars or with an organ and a choir? Do we want red carpet or blue carpet in the sanctuary? <laughs> Someday this carpet's going to have to be replaced. It's a dangerous time in a church. He says you could make a good argument every day if you wanted to, but you wouldn't get much done. And anytime you don't have a relationship with somebody, it's going to be easier, and these are his words, to demonize them. Taylor says you want to focus on what you can work on together. You have to accept the arguments on the other side as valid when they are. When we stand, when those of us who go down and stand at the on the, the life chain. You realize most of the people standing down there are Catholic, not Protestants. We stand with them. He says, at least understand what, they, what their arguments are so that you're able to converse. Because if you don't know anything about what the other side is talking about, you're not going to be able to understand that perspective. And Taylor goes on to say, no two people agree with each other all the time. If you don't believe me, ask your significant other. Most of my clients are married couples. This is when I'm working as a therapist. Allred says, and there are important differences. That's what our elections are about. That's democracy. That's healthy. What isn't healthy is when you assume that the person who dis disagrees with you is also a bad person. <coughs> because if you can't disagree without thinking someone else is bad or evil, then you start pulling apart the seams of our country, and we have to be very careful about that. Now, everything in Scripture points to Jesus. So let's look at how Jesus handles it when the scribes from Jer Jerusalem misunderstand and then demonize him. Look at verses 23 through 26. And he called to them, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. <clears throat> and if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Jesus stomps off in a huff, right? No. He starts yelling and screaming at them. No. He tries to shame them on Facebook. No. He tells a story. He points out their error in logic, but he doesn't shame them directly. He kind of, Jesus has this way of coming in the back door with people. He invites them to think along with him. It's like, guys, you're accusing me of being possessed and casting out 
demons by being possessed. He's like, that's like Satan fighting against Satan. That just doesn't even make sense. He's but the first thing he does is he, he recenters his purpose. He reminds them of his purpose and us of his purpose. Because they're talking about Beelzebul, some prince of demons that was a Philistine god. And he brings it back to the word Satan. He centers his purpose in this world in confronting and defeating Satan. He says, how can Satan cast out Satan? They haven't used that word, Satan. He does. This has nothing to do with some demonic prince or the Old Testament problems with the Philistines. This has nothing to do with any of that. Jesus' life and ministry was a direct confrontation with Satan, the king of demons. And Jesus is very clear. Satan is still strong. Look at verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds that strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Satan is the strong man. And Jesus is the stronger one who enters the strong man's house. His territory. This fallen and sinful world. And he overpowers the strong man. Jesus has bound the strong man. And is actively plundering his house. Jesus is saying <clears throat> that he is stronger than the one who they accuse him of being in cahoots with. He is true power and true authority, but he isn't strutting his stuff. He isn't yelling and screaming. He isn't trying to shame them. He's speaking the truth gently through a story, through a parable that invites people. He's inviting them, the people around him, to think with him. He's trying to win them over, not win over them. When you and I are talking to somebody who disagrees with us, especially about issues regarding our faith, are we trying to win them over or are we trying to win over them? Are we trying to win a person or are we trying to win an argument? We have devolved into people who try to win arguments and think that by doing that, we're going to win the person. And there is a time and a place for healthy debate and argument. Don't get me wrong. But yelling and screaming and devolving into name calling is not the way of Jesus. Because they've accused him of being a demon. And he's telling them a story. He's reaching out to them. He's trying to win them over, not win over them. Today we're more interested in winning over people and winning the argument than we are in winning people over to Christ. Sometimes we need to shut up and live our lives and let them see Jesus in it. When they spit on us and hit us and call us names, and those days may come. They may come. But he does offer a warning. Again, indirectly, he doesn't accuse anyone of anything here. He simply makes a statement. <clears throat> Look at verses 27 or 28 through 30. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now the first thing Jesus says is positive. There is no sin that a human can commit that God will not forgive up to and including blasphemy. Jesus says, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Blasphemy is this defiant attitude of hostility toward God. <coughs> What Jesus is saying is that there is no person who is outside the reach of God's grace. The thief on the cross found redemption. Saint Paul, one of, before he was a saint, he was a sinner. And he was a deep sinner who was blasphemous. 
He rejected actively Christ as the Jewish Messiah. He sought to persecute those who believed in him. He wanted to stamp out the, this, this Jesus movement and the Jewish faith up to and including, if it was necessary, killing the people who were promoting this faith. He breathed murderous threats against the Christians. And he was there when Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was stoned to death, holding the cloaks of those who were throwing the stones and giving his approval. He was a blasphemous man, and he found hope, and he found faith in Jesus Christ. And because God has a great sense of humor, he wound up writing most of the New Testament. <coughs> that is grace that falls like rain. Paul wasn't a good man. He was a blasphemer, but he repented. He gave his life to Christ. He received and he accepted God's forgiveness. And his life was forever changed. And he himself was martyred for his faith in Christ. He was there when the first martyr was killed. And then he was later martyred himself. As Pastor Erwin Lutzer says, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. Do you believe that? That God can forgive you? Not only can, but will and wants to. But then Jesus offers this warning. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. When I was growing up, that verse terrified me. Millions of Christians have spent tons of time worrying that they have somehow unknowingly committed this sin. Like God is trying to trap us or something. Like God isn't like that. He isn't trying to fool us or trick us or trap us so that He doesn't have to forgive us. God, malicious human beings are like that. God is not. Remember the context. First, Jesus is speaking directly to the religious leaders. Those who had direct access to the Word of God and supposedly knew how to interpret it. Secondly, He is offering a warning, not accusing anyone of anything, including those who were accusing Him of demonic activity. He never once says, and you are the, that person. These religious leaders had heard him teach with their own ears. They had seen him heal and cast out demons with their own eyes. They couldn't deny any of that. They'd seen it, as had the people flocking to see Jesus. They weren't denying the existence of Jesus or of God as atheists do. Many atheists have come to faith in Christ. They weren't denying his power either. They couldn't. They and everyone around them had seen it firsthand. Because they couldn't deny it, they were only left with one option, and that was because they continued to reject Him. They were attributing it to a work of the devil. And Mark tells us that they were, were, they were saying He has an unclean spirit. It's ongoing repetition. They didn't just say it once. It was over and over again. He's talking about a calloused heart who sees and experiences the grace of God. And the goodness of God. And rejects it over and over and over and over and over again. That kind of hardness of heart. It was a fixed attitude. Callousness. If you're even worried that somehow you've accidentally committed this sin, don't worry you haven't. We also need to understand that Jesus did often use hyperbole overstatement to make a point. He's certainly pointing out that they're on a dangerous path toward unremitting unbelief. Of heading to their graves without ever responding to what Jesus had done right in front of their eyes. And that's ultimately what Jesus is talking about. Now Paul, he for a long time, a long time, Refused to believe. He had a hardened, callous heart that the Holy Spirit was able to break. You have never encountered a heart 
that the Holy Spirit can't touch. No matter how deep in addiction or violence or abuse or sin someone is, you have never encountered a heart that the Holy Spirit can't break. He's talking about this life trajectory that gets to a point where it's almost impossible to come back from. And ultimately, those who pass into eternity without ever responding to the goodness of God in their lives. John 6.37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. There is absolutely no repentant heart that Jesus will ever turn away. No matter how hardened that heart had become. He's warning the religious leaders to be careful about their hardened hearts and becoming so hardened that they can't see what God is doing right in front of them and ultimately refusing to repent right up to the day they die. Because dying apart from Christ is ultimately what leads to eternal death. Not dying before you can say, I'm sorry. Dying without turning your heart over to Christ. Jesus, that's what Jesus is warning them about. And they're on that path. But they're alive. There's still time to repent. But with each repetition of their blasphemous statement, Jesus is evil, they take a step closer to that ultimate fate. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the defining moment in history. And your knowledge of that life, his life, his death, and his resurrection for you is the defining moment of your life. What are you going to do with it? And when Jesus was misunderstood, how did he respond? He tried to win people over not to win over them. What's your approach? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that your grace falls like rain into our lives and it comes from a source that has no end. May we come to the place Will we willingly repent? Will we turn away from our lives apart from you and give our lives to you? And as you shape and transform us, may we come to the place where when we are misunderstood, we know and we remember that you were misunderstood too. May we respond as you did, trying to win people over not win over them. We ask this in Christ's name.